doctor, lawyer, adventurer, pirate, filibuster, illegitimate president, probably the murder of tens of thousands of people. This is the story of a man so restless that he wanted to have and rule his own country and for a short while may have done that. You'll find out in just a second. Okay, yes, this is the story of the American doctor who was a civilian who took over part of Mexico and Nicaragua for a while. Real quick, I just want to say thank you guys so much for 200,000 subs. I don't know what happened. I literally have grown 100,000 subs in the past month, so... You guys are making my dreams come true. I really appreciate you all. If you haven't subscribed, consider if you want to, if you're into weird stuff like this. And guys, I just wanted to do this story because this is one of the strangest stories I feel like I've never heard about. I recently heard about this story. This guy kind of is like Alexander the Great or Genghis Khan or one of those other huge conquerors, except he's really small scale. I mean, he probably shouldn't be considered like one of them, but he reminds me kind of Napoleon Bonaparte, except... He didn't conquer as much, but he is still short, so he probably was competent. Anyways, let's get into it. William Walker was born into a prominent family in Nashville, Tennessee in 1824. He was a child genius and obviously very restless, as you will see later on. William graduated at the top of his class from the University of Nashville at the age of 14, and then studied to become a doctor at 17 and traveled to Europe for two years, lived in Philadelphia, practicing as a doctor for a while, and then ended up getting a degree in both medicine and another in law so he could legally practice as both a doctor and a lawyer. Although he stood at only 5 foot 2, people said that he had a really commanding presence and was very charismatic, like another ma famous leader. But I think a turning point in this man's life though was at the age of 25, when William Walker fell in love and got engaged to be married to a woman named Ellen Martin only to have her die of yellow fever right before they could get married. 1800s moment. And after this, and very unusual to the time, William never remarried or had any children, despite being from such a prominent family and having so many credentials, which was really odd at the time, so I'm sure the death of his fiance caused him a lot of grief. So after his fiance's death, he became an editor at the New Orleans Daily Crescent. Crescent. It's, it's Crescent, guys. Where strangely enough, Walt Whitman was briefly a colleague of his, which if you don't know who Walt Whitman was, he was one of the most well-known and influential American poets who wrote that famous poem, Oh Captain, My Captain, about Abraham Lincoln right after his assassination. So at this point it was 1848, filibustering was all over the headlines, which if you don't know what filibustering is, it's also known as freebooting. It's when someone commits an unauthorized military expedition into a foreign country to create or support an already existing political revolution or succession. Basically, it's the act of expanding United States territory through private means rather than being an official U.S. military group. For example, in 1850, there was a Venezuelan-born man named Narcisco Lopez, and he wanted to take over Cuba from the Spanish Empire and maybe make it into American territory, according to Wikipedia. Anyways, this guy was a Spanish military leader at one point, and for some reason he ended up hating the Spanish crown, so he wanted Cuba to be independent, and he led a group of mainly American mercenaries in an assault on Cuba where they ended up losing. And Lopez died a horrible death. What's interesting, though, about this filibuster army was that they carried this flag that's became the modern-day Cuban flag uh, after they got their independence in the early 1900s. Now, you may think that filibustering was quite a stretch to be able to do at this time, but Texas had actually just recently broken off from Mexico just years before, and this was a great example of a region in a sovereign nation being taken over by Americans and then getting statehood later on. And even though this was way back in the day, filibustering was illegal. You could get like three years in prison and a $3,000 fine, which was a ton of money at the time. I just like the fact that the U.S. had to make a law um, that individuals couldn't try and take over other na nations. It was necessary for them to make that law. <laughs> but the whole reason this American Empire idea was so popular at this point was because of an idea called Manifest Destiny. Manifest Destiny was a cultural belief in the 1800s where American settlers believed that they were destined to expand across North America. Now, there was no set principles for this idea, but the idea basically was these people thought they had a moral obligation to expand their way of life. Andrew Jackson was quoted saying it was to extend the area of freedom, which sounds a lot like the Vietnam War. Anyways, after William worked at the paper in New Orleans for a while, he moved again to San Francisco where he promoted filibustering or freebooting in another paper. Because William really wanted to conquer Central America and take it over and turn it into new American slave states. So he's a California journalist. 
he ends up getting national attention because he was dueling a fellow journalist named William Graham. And in this duel, William ended up getting shot twice in the chest and almost dying, but almost immediately after this, he was like, yeah, it's time to take over Mexico. I guess maybe he had like a, a near-death experience and he was just like, what am I doing with my life? Writing papers? I'm a doctor and a lawyer. I should be doing bigger things like taking over countries. So at this time, it was a common belief among filibusters that the Mexican government didn't really have control over their border territory on their side. So from a lot of their perspectives, if you could take over that land, you could take it over pretty easy. But then once you had it, if you created a government, it could be your land to defend and, you know, have as your own country. So William Walker, inspired by the examples of Texas and Lopez attempting to take over Cuba, set out to conquer the Mexican states of Sonora and Baja California which Baja California was really sparsely populated. And I think Sonora was a little bit less sparsely populated, but didn't have a ton of people. So at first, William tried to be civilized. He headed down there on a diplomatic mission, trying to be sneaky. He sailed to the Baja Peninsula and formally asked the Mexican government if he could set up a private mining colony and fortress against Indian attacks close to the U.S. border in their neighboring state of Sonora. But for some reason, someone went to the authorities and was like, this guy's definitely trying to create an American empire, which, I mean, of course they could figure that out. He's in the newspaper supporting all this filibustering all the time. I mean, that's like the biggest form of media back then, so obviously they're going to know. So the authorities immediately kicked him out of their country, which I guess this made him kind of frustrated because he then said that he would return to Sonora, not as a putative settler, but as a conqueror. He then started recruiting men to his cause, got a bunch of weapons and provisions for a proper invasion, and then got a ship called the Arrow. But the US authorities heard that he was doing this, which keep in mind is illegal, and immediately seized his ship. However, at midnight one night, William had a bunch of his men raid their old ship, and then steal quite a bit of their supplies, and then sail on a new vessel called the Caroline, where they headed down to Mexico. Now at this point, William only had a small army of 45 men. He landed in the port city of La Paz, which is the capital of Baja, California. And he and his men quickly seized the governor's office where they lowered the Mexican flag and raised a new one which Walker had designed for his new country. This is what it looks like. It's red with two stars. I don't really know what it means. He also renamed the state the Republic of Lower California. William gave himself the title of president and declared, The Republic of Lower California is hereby declared free, sovereign, and independent. And all allegiances to the Republic of Mexico is forever renounced. He also placed Lower California under the laws of the American state of Louisiana, which of course made slavery legal since that was a big thing for him. Back in the United States, word of the insane attack he just did spread, and most Americans actually thought it was a great idea. Uh, and they gave him the nickname, the Gray-Eyed Man of Destiny. Hundreds of reinforcements sailed down from San Francisco who wanted to join William's new Republic of Lower California, but mainly because they wanted to have lucrative mining rights to that area. So this is early 1854. He had been reinforced by 200 Americans and also 200 Mexicans who thought that his vision was actually really good. However, when they got there, they realized that William's army was tiny, uh, not equipped very well, and really didn't have any game plan on holding their territory. And the Mexican government, being pretty small at that time, couldn't send a huge force to destroy William. But they got some soldiers, along with some local Mexican ranchers, to take up arms against William's force, and chaos broke loose. His ship, the Caroline, that had carried all his stuff there, set sail against his orders, taking almost all of his supplies, which was terrible for his army. And still very early in 1854, Walker decided to take a huge risk and try and conquer the very strategic city of Sonora, because he thought that if he could capture it, it would mean that more volunteers would come and more investors would send supplies, uh, but apparently it was pretty hard. As he headed for Sonora, William's men started deserting him left and right. He tried to keep the men from running, he shot two of them and ended up whipping a bunch of them. But by the spring of the year 1854, Walker realized that he had failed his invasion. William Walker and his only 35 remaining men marched north and surrendered to the U.S. authorities at the border, never having reached the city of Sonora. So basically, he went there in the fall of 1853, took over power of La Paz, just a strategic area, 
and then try to take over another politically strategic area and everybody was like screw this this is really difficult let's leave so obviously what walker had done was very illegal he was tried with violating the neutrality act but was found not guilty almost immediately in like eight minutes his trial was very short nobody really cared that he had done it even though there's no telling how many people died I'm pretty sure the judge had some pretty similar opinions to him of like manifest destiny and stuff. And it was stated that the U.S. government saw Walker more as a pest than anything, which would soon change. William Walker returned to his law practice with no repercussions, convinced that he would have succeeded if he had more men and supplies. But within one year of returning to his normal life, he was back on his world domination thing. In 1850, Nicaragua was looking rather tasty to William. It was rich, green, had really good shipping through there because the Panama Canal hadn't been built yet, but most importantly was in the middle of a civil war. The civil war there was between two opposing political parties, the conservatives and the liberals, who were fighting over power mainly in control of the shipping lanes, which were, as I said, really lucrative at this time. And the liberals were like, you know who's good at taking over countries? William Walker. Surely he won't take it over for himself whenever he joins our force. <laughs> the liberals were losing and they really wanted to capture the city Granada, which was really strategic in their winning. So they contacted William, who claimed that he was nervous about breaking the Neutrality Act this time. You know, the anti-filibustering act. So he told them that he would only come if they invited him as a colonist and granted he and his men land rights. They did this and he immediately rushed down with 60 well-armed men, mainly mercenaries that had been veterans in the Mexican-American War. And once he landed there, was reinforced with another 100 Americans and roughly 200 Nicaraguans. His army marched on Granada and captured it in October 1855 after heavy fighting. And then guess what William did? He managed to make himself the head of the Nicaraguan military by being kind of sneaky. And because he was such a great general and just being William Walker himself, he immediately declared himself president. Actually, no, he did not. He installed a puppet government so that he can control it all himself, but not be the face of it and get in trouble. And if you think this doesn't happen today, you're wrong. Although William had taken so many insane risks up to this point, he probably would have had a pretty long and successful career as a Central American imperialist. That is, if he hadn't made an enemy with another very powerful American, Cornelius Vanderbilt. Now, if you don't know, the Vanderbilts were once the wealthiest family in the United States, and Cornelius was actually the richest single American up until his death. He probably had like 10 times the wealth of the country of Nicaragua. And Cornelius had business there because he had an international shipping empire. And President Walker revoked his rights to ship through Nicaragua and also seized Vanderbilt's steamships as property of his country. And the reason why Walker did this is because two other prominent businessmen, C.K. Garrison and Charles Morgan, told him to do it because they would support him with supplies and stuff if he would take Vanderbilt's assets because I think they wanted control over it themselves. Vanderbilt, as you would expect, was enraged by this. He sent soldiers to drive him out of the country, and he sent word to the Costa Rican military, I will pay for your troops if you will help me get rid of Walker. Which his force ended up combining with the forces of other countries, mainly Costa Rica, but also smaller support came from Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. Which is really funny because these countries were terrified that Walker would try and take over their country, which makes you realize how powerful this guy had become. But I guess that was a pretty valid fear at this point. So with the Costa Rican forces, the Vanderbilts, and all those other countries, they put major pressure on William Walker. And at one point while William Walker was retreating, he put corpses in some wells of drinking water along the way. And when the advancing Costa Rican army drank some of the water, they got cholera and took it back to their home in Costa Rica too. Where some sources say 10% of Costa Rican's population died of cholera because of William Walker. That's pretty bad. At this point, William Walker was super desperate. Uh, this time he actually declared himself president of Nicaragua. What's kind of interesting is the real US president, Franklin Pierce in 1856, recognized him as the genuine leader of Nicaragua. And President Walker made English the national language of Nicaragua. Based and also legalized slavery, not based. But the reason he did this is because he was trying to get help from the southern United States, but 
they didn't really support him. So the overturnment of their anti-enslavement laws made a lot of Nicaraguans angry. And also I'm sure English becoming their first language was also making them mad because I'm pretty sure almost everybody spoke Spanish. <laughs> and shortly after this, Walker's army was defeated at the Second Battle of Rivius. Rivi Ri Rivis. Rivis. Rivas. R-I-V-A-S. Rivis. Where William Walker, in a desperate attempt to escape, ended up burning down basically the entire city. It was said that the only thing that remained was an inscription on the ruins that said, Here lies Granada. This dude has so much collateral damage, it's crazy. Surrounded by the Costa Rican troops and Vanderbilt's mercenaries, William negotiated and surrendered in 1857, and was forced to return to the United States, once again setting sail for New York. In New York, William was also tried again for violating the Neutrality Act, and once again was found not guilty. Maybe because he kind of covered his tracks by becoming a colonist there, or maybe because he knew law so well, or maybe just because people liked what he was doing. A lot of people thought he was really awesome, which leads me into another thing. He was super popular at this point. When he showed up on the shore, it was like everybody was trying to interview him. Uh, everybody wanted a speech from him. It was crazy. And guess what William immediately started doing again? Yep, planning to return to Central America and take back his country, Nicaragua. He was on probation at this point, and he was in New Orleans, and... Somehow, he grabbed some supporters and grabbed a boat and immediately headed off pretty much right away. His first two comeback attempts failed. Uh, the first one, William's ship hit a coral reef off the coast of Belize, and he had to be towed all the way back to Alabama by the British Navy. And in his second attempt, he was once again arrested by the U.S. Navy when he tried to land in Costa Rica because they knew exactly where he was going because he was really popular and they were watching him and they're like, oh, there he goes again, we'll just blockade him but he was still determined to get back his country and this was now his fourth attempt at taking over Nicaragua you'd think people would stop supporting him but that's where you're wrong thanks to his fame in the newspapers again he recruited 91 men and this time his plan was to take over a portion of Honduras he marched south to Nicaragua but Walker's forces were faced with fierce resistance by the Honduras military and they were backed up by the British Navy, and the British Navy kept the American forces from entering to help William Walker, because I guess he had some other people sent down to help him. And with no reinforcements and dozens of men dying from tropical diseases and they didn't have hardly any ammunition, William Walker was once again convinced to surrender. A British Commodore assured William that he would be spared from the wrath of the Hondurans, but that was a lie. The British captain basically screwed him over, and just a few days after they got him, he was standing before a Honduran firing squad. William Walker was only 36 years old when he was executed in 1860. And in his final words, he asked for mercy for his men, stating that the Honduras expedition was solely his fault. Which was really like one of the only nice things it seemed like he did throughout all of history. And with him, the idea of filibustering died. Most people did not try the filibuster after this for whatever reason. And just months later, South Carolina would succeed from the Union, starting the American Civil War. William Walker's filibustering did have a significant negative impact on the United States as well. It seemed to inspire the Confederacy to want to maintain and expand their territory for enslavement purposes, which obviously is very bad. Now, the idea of taking over another country does subjectively seem like really cool and like a romantic idea and all, but when you think about all the deaths and horror of war that you would inflict on others and the lives and families you would rip apart, you realize that so many good people and bystanders and people that are just trying to protect their land would be collateral damage in these little wars, which is not cool. So the story of William Walker although it does seem to sound kind of glorifying of this kind of thing, is the story of an evil man who likely was responsible of the deaths of tens of thousands of people. If it was 10% of Costa Rica, that would be a lot of people. I don't know how many that would be, but that's... pretty bad play on his part. Anyways, war is not cool, okay? But that's all I got for this video. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you for 200,000 subs, like I said at the beginning. I don't know how I'm growing so quick. It's all thanks to you guys. You're making my dreams come true. Um, I really like doing this story. I thought this was a really cool one. I feel like nobody's really talked about this very much. 
I sure didn't learn about it in school or anything. But yeah, consider subscribing if you like weird stuff like this. If you're weird like me, there's something wrong with you. That's okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll get through this. Anyways, don't try to take over any countries through violent means. And have a great day. Goodbye. Goodbye.